One of the first ways that people describe Unitarian Universalism is that there is room here for a wide spectrum of beliefs. Among the diversity is the belief that there is no God. In fact, atheists, especially humanism, have been foundational to modern Unitarian Universalism. That includes a whole range of, I don't believe in God. The word God doesn't really mean anything to me. Why do we need God? I find God really problematic because of the way I, it was used in my personal history. All of that is welcome here. Many among us rest comfortably in the atheist camp, and yet from time to time, I will talk about God at Tapestry. You will occasionally hear the word and hopefully some thoughtful exploration of how we might align ourselves with God's work in the world. When atheists hear the word God, there are a few different options in how to respond, and different circumstances call for different responses. If we're really honest, most of the time our mood is one of the biggest defining circumstances. But for, for today, I invite you, theist, atheist, agnostic alike, to begin to notice how you typically respond to the word. One option is to ignore it. That's a quick, convenient way that avoids conflict. The only drawback to completely ignoring the word God is that it risks some nuance in what's going on. It's like talking about history without religion or poetry without emotion. You can ignore it, but some of the meaning gets washed out too. Perhaps you choose to tolerate it. I suspect this is what most commonly happens at Tapestry. Knowing that God is meaningful to others, you tolerate the use of the word, even if it rubs you the wrong way. If you're feeling especially defensive, or if you hear God being used in a way that's oppressive or destructive to reason, you might ask that the word not be used, or even the idea Secularism is not a bad thing in government and schools and research. Another option when we're feeling generous is celebrating that God is meaningful for other people, even when it makes little sense to us. This is what Cheryl was talking about. It's especially true when we hear the comfort and inspiration that oppressed communities find in this sort of personal relationship with the divine. It's okay to celebrate for them, even while knowing it doesn't resonate with us. And finally, if you have the energy and the motivation, maybe you will translate God. 95% of the times that I use the word here at Tapestry, it can be translated immediately to human goodness and creativity, or the drive toward beauty and life in nature, or mystery, or maybe even luck. Today, I want you to hear that I know probably a third to half of this community is atheist. I see you, I hear you, and your path is respected. And I want to offer some opportunities to translate or get around God altogether and find inspiration without that big, overinflated three letter word. A few years ago, I was finishing my doctorate. And I found a UU theologian who writes about a minimalist vision of transcendence. You may have heard me talk about this before. If I'm honest, the writing is pretty dry, as dry as the title would suggest, or as dry as doctoral research would suggest. But to describe his faith, Jerome Stone tells a story of finding comfort when he most needed it. 
He remembers receiving the phone call that his father had passed away. After the call, he sat on the living room sofa, slumped over, and visibly distraught. His daughter, just eight years old at the time, asked what was wrong. Oh, Dad, she said, and threw her arms around him in a giant hug. Her hug, he writes, was an unexpected and freely given gift of comfort and love. It's what religious people call grace. For him, this gift was not the work of a personal God, nor was it a meaningless event. He understands his daughter's hug as transcendence because it came from outside of the situation in which he found himself. It was unusual and unexpected, but powerful. In a world of doubt, there is power in every little act of hope. In an age of division, there is power in every small act of unity. Moments of encountering the sacred are brief, and it takes attention to recognize them. But the moments of grace in our life are real. If we pay attention to them and sweep them together, they can be the foundation for a simple and sincere faith. Jerome Stone talks about a minimalist vision of transcendence because he wants to say that the sacred doesn't have to be huge. It can actually be quite small and quite rare. So much of religion of various sorts has been obsessed with how big and pervasive God is, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, transcending all time and space and all good starting with those huge inflated claims is a very strange way to prove anything. So Stone takes the exact opposite approach, a minimalist approach. The goal isn't to prove the biggest description of God, but to recognize that small emergence of unexpected good is worth our attention and it's ground for reverence. He talks about the transcendent, the extra goodness that comes from beyond the present situation or our own doing. Now, why bother having faith in such a small thing? There are a few very good reasons. One is that observing the little bits of grace, the moments of transcendence, brings some hope, renewal, and healing into our lives. It takes attention, but the hope is there. And it reminds us that we're not alone. Time and time again, someone or something emerges out of the blue to be with us in the struggle. Even if those moments are small and fleeting, they remind us that we are connected to a web of life. The second reason to cultivate this faith is that it calls us all to a higher level of conversation and critique. Embracing faith gives us a bigger picture to critique our lives and the world around us. God isn't the only foundation for morality or critiquing society. You are some very faithful folks. You have deeply held values and convictions, and I have seen you express those in the world without relying on God. Lately, I've been watching a TV series called Silo on Apple TV. It's a post-apocalyptic science fiction show where the remaining 10,000 people are living underground in a giant silo. It's not quite as dark as it sounds. <laughs> One of the taglines of the show is, thank the founders. Because all the books were banned and history was largely erased, they aren't clear on exactly how the founders created the silo and everyone got inside. They don't really know their history. They just know that the outside world is too poisonous. Without some big theological framework, when anything good happens, they turn to the phrase, thank the founders. 
perhaps more people have watched The Handmaid's Tale and the ubiquitous phrases of under his eye or blessed be the fruit. I find myself saying, thank God, even when that's not what I mean most of the time. After a few years of being familiar with Jerome Stone's idea of the minimalist vision of transcendence, this week I realized that part of living out that theology is finding a deep sense of gratitude without specifying to whom or what we are grateful. And I feel at a loss for a common phrase that describes that sense of gratitude our sense of awe for the beauty and goodness of life without ascribing it to someone or something that made it happen. The only phrase that I came up with was, what a blessing, or thank goodness. But I think we can do better than that. What do you say? What expression just falls out of your mouth when something unexpected and wonderful happens. It wouldn't be right to talk about atheism and Unitarian Universalism without talking about humanism as well. Often people think about humanism in relation to the Italian Renaissance of the 14th century. Before that time in Europe, nearly all art had been religious. It was either funded by the church or it depicted sacred as subjects. But Italian artists and intellectuals began to look elsewhere for inspiration. Rather than turning to Christianity, they turned to the classical thing, themes of Greece and Rome and to our human experience of love and beauty. Within UU circles, though, the humanist movement we focus on came about in the 20th century. After the conclusion of World War I, a sense of great possibility was in the air. As they saw it, the Great War was over. Hooray for humanity. Between scholars and theologians, the humanist ideals of equality, scientific achievement, and human dignity were at an all-time high. And a group of thinkers came together in 1933 to publish the Humanist Manifesto. There were 65 thinkers on that first manifesto. Over half of them were Unitarians and half of the Unitarians were clergy. From that moment to today, humanism has been a powerful force in our tradition. The manifesto is really long. It's in really sexist language, but it included aspirations for human relationship, the end of war and inequality, statements about religion and science, more than anything, humanists believe in the ability of science to describe the world around us. Both social sciences and hard sciences supply unprecedented understanding of our universe. We didn't have to derive knowledge from theological speculation anymore. Instead, we rely on experimentation and reason in our search for ourselves. Because of the influence of humanism, we, you use, believe that it's irresponsible to dismiss the finding of science in our religious lives. Science and reason can't be ignored in our faith. They should be embraced, and they can deepen our sense of meaning. While the humanists of 1933 pushed new limits, saying that science essentially trumps theology, they might have come to that understanding as a natural outgrowth of our Unitarian tradition. Unitarians didn't become a separate tradition, mostly because they rejected the Trinity. They became a new religion because they believe that we humans have the capacity for moral improvement and they insisted on using history to understand the Bible. 
the founding father of American Unitarianism, William Ellery Channing, way back in 1819, said, We profess not to know a book which demands a more frequent exercise of reason than the Bible. Its language is singularly glowing, bold, and figurative, demanding more frequent departures from the literal sense than that of our own age and country, and consequently demanding more continual exercise of judgment. In 1819, we sometimes talk about the humanist influence on Unitarianism, but it would be just as appropriate to talk about the influence of Unitarianism on humanism. Now, we all know that atheists believe that there is no God. It's a clear and simple statement of belief. Humanists, on the other hand, believe that God just isn't necessary for a meaningful life. Humanists don't usually argue against the existence of God. They just don't think it's necessary or all that helpful. It's a faith in human potential and goodness of our world without belief in God. And humanists embrace religion. Last month at our annual UU Ministers Association meeting, I found myself in a small group discussion with a colleague who had dual standing as a UU minister and a leader in the American Humanist Association. Though they are small and kind of on a shaky foundation these days, the American Humanist Association might actually be our closest religious sibling. This week, I was poking around on their website, and I found the group's very straightforward tagline is, Good Without a God. Humanists actually embrace religion. They believe that with all of its ritual and culture, religion is a tool for humans to make meaning in our lives. Religion builds community, it shares history, it connects generations as a bridge, it builds an ethical atmosphere. We know this, this is sort of what we do here at Tapestry, hopefully. Religion does a lot of wonderful things, all without God. What humanism brings to liberal religion is a sense of perspective. Religion is helpful meaningful and true only to the extent that it enriches people's lives. They said religion exists for people, not the other way around. Humanism puts us at the center of things. Just like Copernicus discovered the heliocentric universe, or solar system rather, it was the revolutionary, it was that revolutionary when he realized that the sun was the center, not the earth. In religious life, the humanist twist is just as revolutionary. Humanists believe that the worth and dignity of every person is of supreme importance. It should be the center of our concern, not what we achieve to appease some god. So I imagine some of you might steal that tagline from the American Humanist Association, good without a God, to describe your own faith, or even what you enjoy about tapestry. We find inspiration in so many different places. In the beauty, the power, the intricacy of nature, we are awakened out of our loneliness by small gestures of kindness. We marvel at the human mind and are driven to work toward creating the best possible future for all people. For some you use, God is also part of the mix of that unfolding. For just as many, the G word simply isn't relevant. And I love that we're able to build a religious tradition where all of that is possible. Amen.